Packing our bags and escaping work stress to enjoy a great night at a lovely tourist sanctuary is a common phenomenon in our modern lives. But the concept of vacations happens to be as old as human civilizations. Welcome to Nutty History. Today, we're looking at what vacationing and tourism were like in ancient times. A lavish Roman summer. The Roman Senate would be put on hold for a recess, so the partisan could be devoted entirely to relaxation and the good life. Of course, they had earned it by bickering and arguing and plotting in the Senate for hours all year to keep the plebeians of Rome in their place and maximize their own family's wealth. They would regather 100 miles south by the craggy sun-drenched shores of Campania, with a view of the smoking funnel of Mount Vesuvius in the distance, surrounded by diamond blue sea water. The poet Horace had given the cities and towns of the Gulf of Naples a five-star review in his poem, No Bay in the World Can Rival the Beautiful Baye. Emperors built luxurious palaces and the elite and wealthy built their splendid villas far from the hustle and bustle of the Roman city, just to have a merry vacation in the summer for two months. These shores were protected from the sea monsters and other evil spirits that Romans believed prowled in the deeper waters of the ocean, allowing them to abundantly swim in the warm waters. Then they would relax in sculpted courtyards and enjoy wine with exquisite seafood such as sturgeon, dogfish, and lobster along with caviar. The late afternoon featured excursion boat sails across the sea, and later they would return to have a delicious oyster dinner to sum up a lavish and rejuvenating day. After that, they would enjoy a walk on the beach sand while wearing wellness flip-flops made of glass and filled with perfumes to pamper their feet. Gotta take care of your feet. But the main feature of these lavish vacations was the thermal baths in the private healing springs built inside villas. Ooh, that sounds nice. The foundations of these thermal baths were built directly into the sea. So nobles could enjoy the bath and swim in the safe and well-tempered pools surrounded by the ocean waves. For the Roman philosopher Seneca, this was the epitome of Roman decadence. He also wrote at length about how gambling, adultery, hedonism, and scandals took the front stage in these retreats. Noble women would pretend to be the women of trade, men would act like teenage boys, and boys would act like girls. One of his shows is about Lavina, who left her senator husband to flee with a young man during such a vacation. The graffiti found at Pompeii among ashes has left no doubt about what the town was really known for. The town of Pateole had not only attracted drunken nobles, but also a lot of antisocial elements which made the town's crime soar. Now, because there were no prying eyes of common Romans and thus the chance of their deeds turning into rumors were minimal, they would do as they please. To be honest, Naples is sounding less like the Hamptons and more like Vegas. Politicians would also use this privacy to conduct less moral and unethical deals and alliances. Lesser privileged Romans also were drawn to the Gulf in the summer, but their destinations were cities like Tibur, now Tivoli, and Antium, now Anzio. Some of them who saved extra were able to visit Baye for a much budgeted trip than the nobles visiting there. After Augustus came into power and formally assimilated Egypt and Greece into the Roman Empire, the Grand Tours came into concept that would include a round trip across the Mediterranean to see a wide variety of notable tourist attractions, such as Delphi, Alexandria, and Athens. The Origins of Modern Vacation However, such tours cost a fortune and were reserved for generals who would win major battles or people who would achieve something significantly important at the time. Thanks to people like Herodotus and Cicero, vacation also became an excuse to gather education from various parts of the world. These tourists also loved to walk in the steps of people who made these journeys before them and discovered amazing elements of the architecture, culture, and natural wonders of other civilizations. Tracing the places in Troy where events happened in Homer's Iliad and the locations of famous battles like Marathon and Thermopylae were crowd pullers, but not as big as the Statue of Sphinx and the Lighthouse of Alexandria in Egypt. Romans loved visiting the Oracle of Delphi, the temples of Greek gods such as Apollos in Corinth, the Parthenon, and the Temple of Aphaea. Panhellenic games like the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games would also pull crowds from all over the world. Tourism encouraged local markets to appeal to them, and new kinds of shops and stores and vendors began popping up, ranging from souvenirs to pleasure shops to appease the tourist. Let's get back to the pleasure shop thing. What was that about? There were no selfie phones or Instagram vlog trends to make vacations memorable, 
so people sought tangible and physical memorabilia to remember their good moments. Terracotta statuettes, trinkets, pots of Hamidian honey, silk scars from Kaz, gnarled walking sticks from Sparta, copies of racy Milesian love stories, and entire columns and thousands of statues were popular memorabilia from Greece. Roman Emperor Hadrian was so fond of collecting memories that he had miniature models of each monument and establishment he visited built inside his palace. Even thousands of years later, destinations may have changed but habits are still the same. People still go to see Egyptian pyramids, Greek temples, and Italian beaches. For souvenirs, they prefer Mount Rushmore and Phuket. When locals learned that new business opportunities opened up, they also weren't shy of making a fool out of tourists to depart them from their money. For both Greeks and Romans, Egypt was a land of wonders. Their unique architecture, culture, social equality, pantheon of beast-human hybrid gods, and obsession with death made them exotic, mysterious, and ancient. And Egyptians took full advantage of this fascination. They will feed misinformation and make stories up to sell anything to tourists and make a good profit out of them. In a way, not a lot has changed. Sailing across the Nile River also became a vacation fad among tourists after Julius Caesar did so with Cleopatra. Egypt was also probably the first place to come up with the concept of a tour guide. Even before the Western fascination for Egypt began, ancient Egypt had a robust navigation system. Maps were provided to the travelers, there were landmarks to help them find the way, and almost every town had a guide to offer to help tourists from getting lost in the desert. In the 5th century BC, Sparta allowed visitors only short, rigidly supervised tours of its sites and restricted the travel of its own citizens. By Roman times, however, Sparta had become a sort of theme park, a must-see on every tourist list, where old Sparta's myths, legendary austerity, and harsh discipline were glorified. However, interestingly, despite being a lucrative industry, tourism in antiquity wasn't without its prejudices. The Romans and Greeks were not much of a fan of having the rest of the Europeans visit them as tourists unless they were part of the Roman Empire. I'm talking about Vandals and Goths, the Huns and the Franks, who Greeks and Romans collectively called the barbarians. The Romans disliked having them as tourists and at the same time had no intention of traveling to the land in their reign. How did they travel? The road system developed by the Romans for invading the rest of the known world covered approximately 50,000 miles. This was the time when people were pretty much confined to traveling 30 miles a day on foot, 80 miles on a carriage, or a little more by horse. A huge hassle to travel during the ancient times was the danger of being on the road after sunset. Zero to little security and no light or electricity made travelers prone to all kinds of dangers from robbers to wild animals. To counter this problem, an inn system was established to install inns on the roads every 30 miles, so that tourists always knew they had a place to rest in the evenings after traveling. And because most people spoke Latin in the Roman Empire, they wouldn't find themselves in a strange land where nobody could understand them. There were also hostels along the way that provided food. Many Romans stayed overnight at the country estates of local families. The so-called hospitium publicum, or public hospitality, was an agreement between families that obliged the host to accommodate the travelers. Those who still found roads too dangerous to travel could choose to travel via water, but marine travel was far from how we see it today. If one had to travel by ship, they must get well acquainted with the cargo on the ship because that's where they belonged. There were no fancy quarters or special seats for the tourists on the ships because there were no tourist ships. To get aboard a ship heading in the same direction one wanted to go, they had to pay the merchant a fee. But the sea route had its own set of perils, like seasickness, dysentery, and pirates. Greek hospitality was renowned long before the Roman sightseers arrived. People who traveled often had guest friends in Greek cities. As early as the 5th century BC, innkeepers had rooms in towns and along roads. Famous temples and sanctuaries provided public accommodations run by the host city or by other cities for their own citizens visiting the shrine. A 4th century politician mentioned the hotel popular with ambassadors near the Temple of the Twins in Pherae, on the northern coast of Greece, and the remains of an ancient hostel for visitors to Athens were found in Plataea in modern times. Meanwhile, rich and powerful tourists like Cleopatra and Mark Antony travel in all glory and luxury. In April of 32 BC, the pair sailed from Ephesus to Samos, bringing with them a retinue of popular actors, comedians, and musicians, and for three weeks, their revels were the talk of Greece. The island resounded with the sounds of pipes and lutes as all-night performances lit up brazenly drunken banquets. Cleopatra? She brought life-size bronze statues of Zeus, Athena, and Heracles, taken from the Temple of Hera as souvenirs from Samos. She also took home scores of paintings and thousands of books 
Antony bought Greek costumes for himself. Cleopatra bought tablets of onyx and crystal, had them inscribed with love letters, and sent them to Antony. In Athens, the drinking bouts continued along with torchlight parades and outrageous behavior that became the talk of the entire Roman Empire. Hot Spots of Vacations Despite all the trouble and risk, people struck with wanderlust were willing to travel to the remote areas of the empire just out of curiosity or in search of a warm bath in a renowned spring. In the first century AD, there was a veritable touristic economy that organized travel for individuals and groups, provided information, and dealt with both accommodation and meals. Yet Greece, Rome, and Egypt had a lot to offer on their own. People visiting Sparta in Roman occupation arrived there reading verses of the popular Roman poet Ovid, hoping to see beautiful Spartan women wrestling bear. But they had to settle for statues of clothed female runners or women warriors brandishing swords. In the theater built by Roman entrepreneurs to accommodate hundreds of spectators, tourists could watch endurance contests in which stoic Spartan teenagers were flogged, or they could witness exciting boar hunts and brutal mock battles. They could even visit the cave where criminals were confined or the altar where human offerings took place. Festivals were real crowd pullers. In Rome, during Saturnalia, a time of jovial merrymaking, many social norms were relaxed and inverted. Gambling, normally outlawed, was allowed in public. Knuckle bones were used for games of chance. They could be rolled like dice or played like jacks. As the name implies, they were initially made from the foot bones of a goat or sheep. They were later fashioned from all sorts of materials like wood, stone, and terracotta, but also from fancier mediums like translucent glass, bronze, gold, ivory, and precious gems. These deluxe knuckle bones have been found across the Roman Empire and are frequently depicted in painting and sculpture, suggesting the widespread popularity of the game. Strict Roman dress codes were also overturned. Instead of the formal and unwieldy toga, Romans of all ranks would put on a synthesis, a comfortable and colorful dinner dress that was normally reserved for private dinner parties. Everyone would wear the freedman's cap, a conical felt hat awarded to freed slaves to celebrate the liberty and free spirit of the holiday. A mock king or lord of misrule was appointed to reign over everyone and give silly orders like telling someone to shout embarrassing insults, dance bear, or chase others around the house. Saturnalia was also about exchanging gifts. Originally started as a single day celebration of winter solstice, the celebration became at least a week long as it became popular and drew tourists even in the winter time. The gifts often ranged from fattened pigs, ivory knuckle bones, incense, and wax candles to even gold rings. In ancient Rome, such rings had a special meaning. During the Roman Republic, only senators, magistrates, and knights had the right to wear gold rings, while everyone else could only wear iron. By the time of the early Roman Empire, customs changed and the members of the higher classes could give a gold ring to a freeborn citizen or a freedman, raising him in rank to a knight. During Saturnalia, a gold ring would make a fitting gift while people drowned themselves in wine. People also traveled from all over the known world to Egypt to celebrate the Tech Festival of Drunkenness. The festival was based on the myth of the chief deity of Egypt, Ra, becoming paranoid and unleashing lion goddess Sekhmet on humanity to eliminate them. Later, he regretted the decision and calmed the goddess by making her drink fields worth of beer to subdue her so that humans could live. The festival began in the Middle Kingdom but fell out of favor in the middle of the New Kingdom, but saw a revival in Roman Egypt as it helped to bring more and more tourists to the nation. The Festival of Drunkenness was celebrated on the 20th day of the first month of ancient Egyptian December. The festival was celebrated in temples and homes alike, allowing more and more people to join, including the tourists. During the festival, people were supposed to drink until they couldn't, and then on waking up, the celebrations would begin. Tell us in the comments, would you like to go back in time and celebrate life like people did in ancient times? What else would you like us to cover? Thanks for watching Nutty History, and please do share, like, and subscribe for more videos like this.